We are in Unit 12, and this is Day 1, Notes 1 of Unit 12. Um, in this unit, we're going to take a look at Taylor series and polynomials, and this is our last unit before we start to review for, our, for the AP exam. So let's take a look at where we have been. In Unit 11, we um, focused on convergence and divergence of infinite series. We're going to use that knowledge in this in this unit. So that's not going away. We're going to continue to use that. Um, let's take a look at some something that we're familiar with, something from last unit. Uh, let me, I'm creating this series. We're just going to start at 1, go to infinity. Let's make it alternate. And let's just do our little alternating harmonic. So if I were to write out the terms in this, and n is starting at 1, when we put 1 in for n, we get negative 1 squared, which is positive 1, over n, which is 1. Then our next term, when n is 2, we're going to have a negative, so I'm going to make that negative 1 over 2, positive 1 over 3, etc. And we could go on and on. This was our alternating harmonic series, and we learned last unit that the alternating harmonic series converged, right? Not only does it converge, but it converges conditionally because if this series was not alternating, it would be the diverging harmonic, right? So this is the converging alternating harmonic series. And in addition, it converges conditionally. Okay, so that we did that last unit. In this unit, we're going to be changing our series and we're going to be making them power series. A power series will have an X in the terms. Okay, so we're still going to have something that looks like this, but somewhere here there's going to be, we're going to be multiplying by X to something with N's in it. For instance, I could keep the same series and then multiply by x to the n. Okay. So my first term here, this would stay the same, right? So it would be 1x to the first minus 1 half x to the second, right? plus one-third x cubed minus one-fourth x to the fourth, etc. And we could keep on going. So now with x's in here, we have what is called a power series. It's still an infinite series, unless we chop it off. It's an infinite series. We can chop anything off and make it a partial sum, right? So. These are going to be, that's why we call this a power series. Think powers of x's, powers of x's, okay? Now, um, this is a specific example of a power series. I could write this a little bit more generally by getting rid of that and just calling that a sub n, okay? And then multiplying by x to the n. And if I do that, I'm going to start n at 0 because that way, I have the possibility the very first term will be when x is 0 and x to the 0, not when x is 0, when n is 0. The first term will be when n is 0 and then we'll have x to the 0 which is 1. So our first term here would be a sub 0, right? And our next term when n is 1, we'd have a sub 1 x to the 1, right? and then etc. We can write a few of these terms out and then we'll do plus dot 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 to say that this series continues, right? So this is a more general form of a power series. This is still a power series, but I can write the most general form of a power series a, a slightly different way. So think about 
think about what we know about functions in general, because this looks just like a polynomial, doesn't it? If I, if I cover this part up and this part up, that's just a polynomial, right? So if I wanted to shift this polynomial some units to the right, what would we do? If I wanted to shift this some units to the right, then I would change every x to x minus some number, however far I wanted to shift it to the right. I'm going to call that c. So I'm going to change that to x minus c to the first change this to x minus c to the second, etc. So that way I can write I can write the most general form of a power series. Okay? So all we're doing is shifting it to the right or to the left. If c is negative, we'll be shifting it to the left. So the most general form of a power series looks like this. Um, sum from 0 to infinity a sub n, and then x minus c to the n, and that's, that's the sigma notation. And then if we write this out, it would look like this. Okay, so this is the general form. of a power series. But when you hear the word power series, just think, oh, it just is a series and it has x powers of x's in it. Okay? Um, we're going to end up calling c our center value because that's, we're, think of it as you, you have some graph and you're shifting it, so you're recentering it. All right? So c is going to be called our center value. All right, all of the a's are just constants. Okay, now I'd like you, I'd like to do a little activity with you, so I'd like you to grab a calculator. So grab your graphing calculator. So I want to show you a purpose to doing this, um, to doing, to for what power series, what the power in power series is. So I'd like you to take your calculator and in for y1, Let's put in something that we're very familiar with. Let's put in sine of x. So n for y1, I'm going to come over and do it as well. n for y1, let's put in sine of x. Okay. Now, we can graph that. So that we all are looking at the same thing, let's do zoom 4. So zoom 4. And there's, sure enough, I knew that that's what sine looks like, right? Um, not a big shock. So that's definitely sine. And in for y2 now. In for y2, and you'll just have to, just this, that we're just exploring a little bit here, okay? So in for y2, I would like you to put in x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial. Let's just put those in. in for okay, so I'm going to put in x minus x cubed over 3 factorial. Remember, factorial is under math, probability, number 4, plus x to the fifth divided by 5 factorial. Okay, so let's take a look at that graph. It's a fifth degree polynomial, and it's positive fifth degree polynomial, so we have an idea of what a fifth degree polynomial will look like. But look at what it appears to be doing. It appears to be laying right on top of that sine x graph, doesn't it? Is it really laying? Is it? Are these equal? Is it actually laying on top of it? If we zoomed way, 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 way in, would it be laying right on top of it? Well, let's see. Let's let's zoom way, way in. Um, I'm going to do zoom box. 
We don't usually use zoom box. I'm going to come out away from the origin a little bit. And I'm just going to go zoom box right, I think right here. I'm going to try to get a tiny little box. I'm hoping I get it on here. Okay, I got the, so the blue one was our sign. There's the red one. If you can see it, the red one is, gosh, it sure does look like it's the same. Maybe we should zoom even more in. Let me go zoom even more in. Okay, there's sign. Oh, well, it sure is close, but now I think I can see that it's not exact. But gosh, it's close. If I were to trace there, if I were to trace there, there's the sine value, there's the y value for sine, and if I go up the other one, there's the y value for the fifth degree polynomial. So are those identical? Let's see, 0 0.7995. 0.79947. Wow, really close, but not identical, right? Really close, not identical. Okay, I'm going to go back to my Zoom 4 because I like that. So, a really good approximation, a starting, startingly good approximation, but not for all values of x. For what values of x is this a, quote, good approximation? Well, it looks to me like maybe 2 and a half, negative 2 and a half to 2 and a half maybe. Looks like that would be a fairly good approximation. But once we get past 3, not a good approximation at all. How do you think we could get an even better approximation? How do you think we could include more x values that are similar? Maybe we could continue this pattern a little bit more. Let's do minus. Let's now do the next term. The next term would be um, x to the seventh divided by seven factorial. And maybe another one plus x to the ninth divided by 9 factorial. Okay, let's see, I'm, I'm going to go graph it again. There's sine, and here comes our ninth degree polynomial. I just think that is awesome. Just amazing. It never fails to amaze me every time. So we were, we used to be, the graphs were very similar from about negative two and a half to two and a half, right? Now it looks like it's all the way out to maybe four, at least four, negative four to four, right? How could we get even more? Well, you could continue that pattern, right? Does it surprise you that we can approximate this transcendental function with a little polynomial for some values of x? For some values of x, we can approximate sine x with this polynomial. I think that's crazy. Just crazy. Okay, now these were both centered at the origin, right? Because our like, it, it was just an x. These were all just x's. They weren't like x minus something. Let's do a little recentering. Let's come in and let's recenter this. So I'm going to subtract. Well, how far over do you want to recenter it? Maybe, let's just go one. Let's just go one. So now I need to come into every x, every x, and I need to insert. I'm going to insert, uh, do I need to hit insert again? Yeah, minus 1. Okay, so in for every x, 
I'm going to insert an x minus 1. It might be better just to go in and rewrite the whole darn thing. But now that I'm here, I'm going to keep going. Make sure I get it all in there. Got one more to do here. Now I'm wishing that I had only stopped at the five, but that's okay. I'm almost there. Okay. So I, I, I replaced every x with x minus one. So now when it graphs, there it shifted the sign away from the origin and now it's doing that. And the polynomial is also shifted to the right one unit. Okay? So that gives you an idea of the shifting. And now, instead of going from, instead of being accurate from negative four to four, now it looks like it's accurate from negative three to five, right? So our interval where we get a good approximation is from negative three to five because we're centered at one. That's an idea of what that centering value does. Okay? All right. So you might be wondering, gosh, that was a, I'm hoping you're thinking, man, that was a great approximation for sine. That's so cool. I wonder what the approximation is for cosine. I wonder what it's like, what it is for like e to the x or natural log x. This is a really, really powerful thing. Okay? to be able to approximate a transcendental function with a polynomial. Really, really cool stuff. So how did I get this? How did I know that this would be the approximation for sine x? And how did, I mean, and if we wanted to continue, we could continue for a long, long while, right? So what makes this be the approximation for sine x? Okay, now you, I just want you to pay attention. You don't need to copy any of this down. It's not anything that I will ever test you on, okay? But it's cool. So I want you to see where, what we're going to be using for the entire rest of this unit. I want you to see where it comes from, okay? So I want, I'm going to write that, so we just found that our function this would be like the sine x, can be represented, can be represented, so it's approximately equal to this series, right? And I'm going to call the series, I'm just going to write out the terms of the series. So some constant, possibly some constant, and then a sub 1, x minus c to the first, a sub 2, x minus c squared, Etc. And I'm just going to write down a few terms. And when I'm doing this in the classroom on the board, I write a bunch of terms, like a bunch. But this this goes on, okay? Because I have the board and I, I can stretch out over the whole board. But I think we'll be fine here on paper doing it like this. Okay, so I would like to find out some kind of a, a value. So I would like to find out what the value of these things are. Okay. So I would like to find out the value of a sub 0, a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, etc. Okay. So um, how could I do that? Well, let's begin by um, letting, let's let x, we can let x be anything that we want it to be. Right? So what's a nice thing that we could let x be? Let's let x equal c, because if we let x equal c, we will get a, one of these terms, right? If we let x equal c, this is just like when we're doing partial, um, partial fractions, we can let x be anything that we want, right? Well, x equals c is a convenient thing to let x be here, right? So if we let x equal c, f of c would be equal to a sub 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0, on and on and on. So f of c is a sub 0. 
Well, that's awesome. That means I can go now and replace a sub 0 with f of c. Cool. Now I know what a sub 0 is. So every time when you're approximate when you're coming up with the polynomial or the series for your function, you're going to begin by finding f at whatever your center value is. It's f at c. Great. How can we find a sub 1? Hmm. Well, to find a sub 1, we're going to manipulate f a hair and then let x equal c again. I'm going to come and I'm going to take the derivative of both sides. Let's take the derivative of both sides. If I take the derivative of both sides, I'll get f prime of x is about equal to, okay? What's the derivative of a sub 0? Zero? 0. What's the derivative of this piece? Well, 1 a sub 1 times x minus c to the 0, right, which will just be 0. That, I mean, that'll just, not 0, that'll just be 1. Plus 2a sub 2 x minus c to the first plus 3a sub 3 x minus c to the second, plus 4a sub 4, x minus c to the third, and I'm going to go ahead and do the next one too, and, and you'll see why as I'm going. The next one would be, what's our pattern, 5a sub 5 times x minus c to the fourth, plus dot dot dot, because that would continue, right? So now we're going to let x equal c again. Well, if we let x equal c, then we would get f prime of c is equal to, remember this is just a 1 right here, so that would be 1 a sub 1, and I know that you could just call it a sub 1, but just bear with me, I'm just going to call it 1 for right now. This term though, when we put x equals c in, it zeroes out, this zeroes out, this zeroes out, this zeroes out, so we get f of c, f prime of c is equal to a sub 1, all right? So a sub 1 is equal to f prime of c. Holy smoke, this is fantastic because now we know what a sub 1 is every time. a sub 1 is always the first derivative of f at our c value. Perfect. I bet I know a pattern you might be thinking. I wonder if a sub 2 is, a, is f double prime of c, a sub 3 f triple prime of c. I wonder if that's the pattern. Mathematicians are always looking for patterns. Well, let's keep on going and we will find out. So how do you think we could find a sub 2? Well, we could take the derivative now of f prime. So we're taking the second derivative of f. Okay. This, I shouldn't have written that, but this was just a sub 1, and then the derivative of a sub 1 is 0. The derivative of this piece will be 2 times 1 a sub 2 times x minus c to the 0, which is just 1, plus 3 times 2 a sub 3 x minus c to the first, plus 4 times 3, a sub 4, x minus c squared, plus 5 times 4, a sub 5, x minus c to the third, plus, and I'm just going to dot, dot, dot it. I may add another term in a little bit, okay? All right, so we're there. Now let's let x equal c again. So f double prime of c will be, all right, 2 times 1 a sub 2 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0. So a sub 2 is equal to f double prime of c 
divided by 2 times 1, which I know is 2, but again, bear with me. So a sub 2 is, now we know what a sub 2 is. a sub 2 is f double prime of c divided by 2 times 1. What's another way I could write 2 times 1? 2 factorial. Well, that kind of blows my theory. It's not quite as easy. Is there anything, but I, again, I'm looking for patterns. Is there anything I could change this to, to make it this pattern? Well, there sure is, because if I divide that by 1 factorial, 1 factorial is just 1, so this is still just f prime of c. For this one, I could divide that by 0 factorial, because 0 factorial is also 1. So we still have just f of c. Now I like that pattern. I wonder if that pattern will continue. Let's find out. So if it continues, a sub 3 should be the third derivative of f at c divided by 3 factorial. Let's find out. I'm going to come and I'm going to take the third derivative. So I'm taking the derivative of that line. So the third derivative of f at, of x will be 0 plus 3 times 2 times 1, looks like a factorial, a sub 3 times, oops, x minus c to the 0, so that's just 1 there, plus 4 times 3 times 2, a sub 4, x minus c to the first, plus 5 times 4 times 3, a sub 5, x minus c squared, plus dot, 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 Let's let x equal c again, and we get f triple prime of c is 3 times 2 times 1, a sub 3, plus 0, plus 0, plus 0, plus 0, plus 0. So a sub 3 is the third derivative of c, uh, the third derivative of f at c divided by 3 factorial, exactly what we hypothesized. The third derivative of f at c divided by 3 factorial. What would a sub 4 be? The fourth derivative of f at c divided by 4 factorial, etc. So, f of x is f of c plus f prime of c divided by 1 factorial. And you can write this divided by 0 factorial if you like. And we can't forget our x minus c up here. So x minus c to the first plus the second derivative at c divided by 2 factorial times x minus c squared plus the third derivative of f at c divided by 3 factorial times x minus c cubed plus dot dot dot. This works for any function. Any function. And that's just amazing. I need you to memorize this. It's not hard to memorize. Let's look at the pattern. The first term is always just f at c. Whatever your function is, f of the center value. And the center value will be given to you, or you can pick it. Most of the time it's given to you. Almost all the time it's given to you. All right? But all you do is evaluate the function at that number. The next term is the first, the x to the first term. This is the x to the first term. Okay. First derivative at c divided by 1 factorial. Next term is the x squared term. Second derivative of f at c divided by 2 factorial. For the x cubed term, it's the third derivative of f at c divided by 3 factorial. 
gosh, this is an easy, easy pattern to, to, to see. Well, if only they were all, all that easy. Okay. I actually want you to notice something about this. Let's say that we, let's say that we ignore all but the first two terms of this. And I'm just going to leave off the one factorial for right now. Does this look familiar to you? Does that look familiar to you? What if I moved over the F? These are just Y values, aren't they? What if I called that Y minus Y sub 1 is equal to the slope? times x minus x sub 1. All this is, is, if we're only using the first two terms, that's exactly, exactly the tangent line approximation. Exactly. Okay. So that is our introduction to the Taylor series. This is the Taylor series formula. And that concludes our introduction. So I usually do this on the same day as you take the Unit 11 test, just to introduce it to you. And then the next day we get into more notes. So I'm going to stop our notes for this one. And I'm going to start back right back up with notes too. Um, and we're going to do our, our kind of, a, it's kind of day two, but really um, this, this was just our intro. Okay. So no homework for this piece. This was just our, our development of this series.